Okay. This is today's news. Are you, are you reading? Are you reading today's news? I mean, the, 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 this is headlines in, you know, the New York Times, USA Today, every newspaper you have, today's headlines, April 2nd, 2024. So that's why I'm talking about it. I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about infection from animals. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a bird flu infecting a person through cattle. That's somebody who worked for the cattle, worked with cattle, and you know I'm sure they ate cattle too. But you know this is a real everyday thing. I, I guess I I just needed to to put this in perspective so you know that this is not something abstract. This is important to you, and I'm going to talk to you about in the next few minutes. So listen. You know, you're 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 not you don't have you have threats from all kinds of places. Uh and one of them is from infections from pandemics like bird flu infecting the human population. Here, people think it started, or it can it certainly can happen. How about other viruses, cancer causing viruses? Uh, but uh, you know, viruses that could kill you 90% of the time. Pay attention. You need to be in as good a health as possible and uh, to avoid some of these vectors. You know, vectors, they, they're, 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 they're things in between you and the virus, like like the steak or, or the uh, the ham or the, the eggs or the, the milk or whatever. You know, it's the animal tissues. That's the vector. So, you know, how could it be more pertinent than April 2nd, 2024 headlines in every paper? Okay. That's why I'm talking about it. Any, any questions, AJ? No, I'm just not, I don't watch the news or read the news like you do. So this is well, very- Well, there you go. You you probably don't live in terror all day long. <laughs> I live in terror. <laughs> Good grief. You, you, you can't turn on, you can't be in contact with, with the world's news and not be just frightened to death. That's probably why I so, don't watch you know, I it. Think, I think it's, I know, but I think it's important if you are that kind of person who wants to be aware of things, and I do, I love, you know, it, this is my world, AJ. Okay, you know, this is my time. I don't want to miss it. You know, for good or bad, I want to at least watch and see what's going on. And if I can have an input, which I think I do in the field of food and medicine, then I want to, I want to take advantage of that. I want to be aware. And unfortunately, there's a side of what's going on that's really scary. But... You know, a lot of this you can't control, but this you control. You have control over your food, 100% control over what you eat. So, you know, you take control of the things you have the ability to take control over. Isn't it what they say, sort of? You know, you realize those things you can't have control over and you move on. Anyway, you do have control over the topic that is uh, following this, this, that we're going to talk about. I have a little bit of additional subject matter at the end too so if you stay tuned i will not only talk to you about uh infections from viruses that originally started in the animal uh the lesser animal i don't know lesser is the right word in, in the animal kingdom that people call the lesser animal kingdom of course for the higher animal kingdom but i know that's in up for debate uh anyway um they, they originated in uh, in well wild animals and domestic animals and farm animals and you know if the animals get infected you can imagine their tissues are infected i know if you cook it thoroughly you kill those viruses right yeah well that's when's the last time you had a a, a a pink a pink steak i used to always order them when i was back into those days i or you know i like i like it pink on the inside well you know pink is raw anyways let's get on to the topic all right, what I want to talk to you about is I want to talk to you about bovine leukemia viruses. You know, we could talk about lymphoma. Lymphoma is a disease. It's one of those blood-borne diseases that involves the lymph system mostly. In other words, you see swollen lymph nodes and so on. In leukemia, what you see is also a blood-borne a cancer where you have proliferation of your blood cells, primarily your white blood cells. And, uh, you know, your spleen gets swollen and you know, many other things happen. So there's a lot of uh, cross between lymphoma and leukemia. But we're going to be talking about leukemia, which um, there's a lot written about, AJ. This is not something that is not beyond your ability to learn about. But good grief, you go to the National Library of Medicine and you plug in 
the terms uh, bovine leukemia viruses and milk, dairy products and milk, you get 2,500 articles. You know, I, I've known about this for for almost 40 years. And I've thought this, this, this is a top, you can see, you can go to my May 2003 newsletter in, entitled Marketing Milk and Disease or the lecture I gave in May of 2003 which is called Marketing Milk and Disease, which is on YouTube. And you can see that I was talking about this back then. I've been to uh, various newspapers, uh, uh, television shows, radio shows. I've even mentioned it on a few radio shows that I've been on. You know, I've tried to get the attention of writers that have a national presence to alert the public about what we're going to talk about today. And they're, they're either frightened or they don't understand the implications of these viral infections. Well, I guess they're starting to. They talk about bird flu infecting cattle, which now infect people. So maybe maybe this is going to be a topic that people are going to pay attention to. I challenge any writer, anybody who has any influence in the media, to look up what I have to say about this. You know, I put the scientific research in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. You can look it up. I'm giving you a majority opinion. I'm not a minority opinion. You know, this is what the bulk of the science says. So read it. Don't live in ignorance. And if you think it's important and you have an ability to influence people, then do it. Your friends, your relatives, you know, people in your church organization, your schools, you know, tell them about this. I've been using this particular topic to at least get an emotional reaction out of people for 40 years. You know, and maybe the virus will get them to give it up and avoid a heart attack or breast cancer or colon cancer. You know, maybe this will get their attention. Although, you know, this isn't as common as breast cancer or heart attacks for sure. And certainly obesity, which affects 91% of the population of the United States. They're too overfat for their health. That's what the new statistics say. Anyway, uh, what you find is in U.S. cattle, nearly 90% of the herds, and I'm going to repeat the statistic over and over again, 90% of the herds are infected. And of these, about half of the cattle are infected in the herds. These are, these are dairy herds, okay? This is the, the dairy industry. When it comes to slicing muscles off your animals and serving them to you as steaks and pork chops and wings and limbs and whatever they sell, uh, what we're talking about when it comes to the beef industry is nearly 40% of the herds are infected with bovine leukemia virus, and that's 10% of the cows in these herds. Once infected, they're infected for life. It's such a, a serious problem in the cattle industry that if you have a bull, you know, it's up for stud, you know, to, to make prize cows, uh, you don't get hired if your bull is infected. They won't hire studs that are infected with bovine leukemia virus. So in the cattle industry, they think it's important, even though it's been ignored in the in the uh, the human medical industry, as you'll learn in a few minutes. It's diagnosed by blood tests, uh, the leukemia virus. We have some crude tests. We have some very sensitive tests. And one of the things that you need to understand as we begin this topic is that bovine leukemia virus is almost identical to the human leukemia virus. And they share so much in structure and metabolism that you couldn't tell the difference before 1970 with our technology at that time. And by the way, this is the virus that causes leukemia in humans that is accepted and recognized, the human uh, leukemia virus. All right. As I told you, about 90% of the U.S. herds are infected. Well, in Canada, it's 70%, Argentina, 84%. Increasing infection rates in many countries, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Japan, United States. You see the worldwide distribution. Red is where this virus is common. These are also, also the, the countries where heart disease is common and breast cancer and colon cancer. Do you see the parallel here? Do you see the common denominator here? The closest contact you have with your environment is your food, ladies and gentlemen. You know, when any anything varies uh, by geography, by environment, 
by country by country, by population by population. If things vary, you have to ask why. And what we're talking about here is changing environments. Then you ask yourself, how do I contact my environment? Well, you do it through air, which is, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, a few pollutants. Not, not too many molecules. No, not many. And then there's water. Yeah, you got H2O and a few pollutants. And then there's food. Tens of thousands of different kinds of molecules in, in a mass volume that is it, tremendous times greater than you'd get with air or water. You know, the impact of the of the food is is really it's your environment unless it's obvious otherwise. All right. Uh, in the production of uh, milk, let's focus on milk here. That's been most of our topic this morning. You know, you have the the, the dairy cows, and uh, they're milked uh, usually twenty four hours a day, twenty four quarts a day. Even when they're pregnant, they milk them. That's one of the reasons you have high estrogen levels in your dairy products, which increase the estrogen in your body, which increases hormone dependent diseases like breast cancer, uterine cancer. Yeah, well, that's a whole other topic. Anyway, uh, they 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 milk the cows at at the farmyard, right? And they put it in vats, and then they put the vats in trucks that have these big fluid containers on them. I guess they call those vats too, uh, tanker trucks. And then they haul them off to a uh, central plant, and then they take the trucks from many different farms. And they dump their milk into this large vat and they mix it all up. And what the United States Department of Agriculture reports that if you look at a vat where 500 or more cows are involved, it's infected 100% of the time. In other words, you can pretty much plan on the dairy foods that you get having this virus. Anyway, that's that's from your own United States Department of Agriculture, the infection rate. Now, that's the United States, okay, what I just told you about. And, and various other countries that make a, lo a lot of money off the dairy industry, beef industry. But, you know, there are places that have taken this, uh, this infection seriously, like in Europe, for example. And uh, in New Zealand, uh, they eradicated the bovine leukemia virus from... They're dairy and beef herds. They did that. Yes, they did. But they also did it in, fin in uh, Finland. It took them 30 years. And by 1996, they'd killed all the infected cows. Somebody thinks this is important. This virus has been known for ever. You know, ever since they found it and started studying it, it's been known to to cross species lines. In other words, the cow virus, the bovine leukemia virus will infect sheep, goats, and chimpanzees and a bunch of other animals. Cross the species lines. I was doing a show in Atlanta one time, selling books. And I met some researchers from Emory University. And I started talking about this subject in the green room. And they said, you know, we did that research in our lab. And what we found was that by injecting the virus, we didn't get as many cases of leukemia in our animals as by feeding it by mouth. Somehow it seems to be more infectious when you drink it as opposed to giving it by shots. Anyway, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's what I was told. But the, the, the way that it's spread is uh, by the, the way we practice on our farmyards, common farm practices. One of the most uh, concerning, if you want to get the attention of, of uh, family, families, mothers, even fathers, anybody who has children or grandchildren or cares about children, you you want to pay attention to this study. You can look it up in Cancer Research, 1974. They they took uh, two groups of chimpanzees. So one was the control group. They didn't give them infected uh, milk. Six chimpanzees. And, 
They all survived. They're all alive at the end of the year. And then they gave another six chimpanzees. They gave them uh, infected milk. Two died of leukemia before the end of the year. I know. Some of you object to doing animal experiments, and I certainly understand that. But this ought to get you off your chair and looking up the study, I would think. Spreading the virus, well, there are various ways that there's farming practices that you know are done today in pretty much every farm. And they are, you know, uh, tattooing the animals and they use tattoo needles. They don't change the needles between uh, between tattooings. But the needles on the syringes, they don't change them. They go from cow to cow to cow, injecting antibiotics and hormones and other things in the animals. They do horn with the same instrument, and that spreads the infection. They do rectal probes on these animals. In other words, they don't change their gloves between rectal probes, and they spread it that way. It's spread from, from mother cow to calf. And then they have a practice of, of uh, taking the early milk of... Uh, the, the pregnant cows, they're called colostrum, and they mix that all together and they fool, they feed this pooled colostrum to all the calves and they spread it that way. As far as uh, spreading disease in the farmyards and other areas of processing of the animal foods, this was uh, brought to everybody's attention in April of 1996 when Howard Lyman, the mad cowboy, appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show. He talked about uh, mad cow disease at that particular discussion. It was the second time mad cow had been talked about on a national show. The first time was on a show called Lifestyle Magazine, which I was co-host of. We talked about that in 1993, mad cow disease. But this is the second time I'd heard about it on the Oprah show. And, and what Howard did is he explained to Oprah about common farming practices. And one of those is to take dying and dead cattle called downers and grinding them up and putting them in with the rest of the cattle feed. So the certain amount of the cattle feed, maybe, you know, 10%, 15% would be dead animals. In other words, they turned herbivorous animals into omnivores or carnivores. Anyway, Oprah heard this, that they were feeding dead and dying cattle to the live cattle, and that's what she was eating on her dinner plate. She said, I'll never have another hamburger again. In the national uh, cattle industry, they sued her in Texas, and they lost. Uh, Oprah won. Howard won. But it's uh, it left, I think, a lifelong uh, impression on Oprah because she it really has naked, not taken up this topic seriously in the time since then, as far as I've been able to see, the, the, the topic of diet. Yeah, drugs, yes. Diet, no. Anyway, um, that's, that's what she said. Well, the, the people in the cattle industry, they, they heard this. And they said, look, you know, we're, we're decent human beings, just like everybody else. We've we got to do something about this. We got This sounds like a foolish thing to do. Well, I don't know where they went that far. But anyway, what they decided to do is they decided that they're going to do Boy, they were going to make it a, an official recommendation within the industry. This didn't come from government. This was in the, in the industry to uh, ban feeding dying and dead cows to live cows. And they stopped doing that in 1997. But, but they continued some other practices you might want to know about. And these were reported first in June of 2003 in USA Today. But this goes on today. This The things I'm telling you about are happening today. What, what they do is they take the dead and dying cows and they feed them chickens and pigs. And then they take the floor sweepings from the chicken and pig pens and they compress them into tablets and they feed them to the live cows. You just imagine a chicken out there chewing on this, this uh, combination meal and spilling a little bit out of their lips and pooping the rest out of their bottoms. And hey, you know, making tablets out of that. There's also the waste plate exemption, which means that if you go to a restaurant and order a tri-tip, I know none of you ever will, but your friends and family still do. If you don't finish it, they will take 
the, the leftover and they'll put it in a special basket. It's the waste plate exemption and they can feed that to live cows. Uh, dead and dying cows are uh, a source of food for the pet industry. So they make up uh, a lot of pet food and you know, there are unethical cattle farmers that feed pet food to their cattle. And when you go to a slaughterhouse, you don't you don't waste anything. And what they do is they they take the blood, you know, you got to drain the blood out of the animal after you slit its jugular veins. You take the blood and you turn that into a, a formula for the calves that spreads the virus. And they say, look, you can't do anything about this. It's just too economically unwise to kill all these cows. You're talking about 90% of the herds in our country. Well, other countries did it. They did it in Europe, Finland, New Zealand. Worldwide and nationwide, you find the incidence of human leukemia parallels the consumption of dairy. In other words, the more dairy is consumed in a population, the higher incidence of leukemia and lymphomas. People who work closely with farm animals, like farmers, veterinarians, butchers, they have a higher incidence of leukemia than the general population. Incriminating. How common is leukemia? Well, uh, every year in the US, maybe 60,000 people develop leukemia. And uh, and some of them die of it, you know, 23,000 die of it, 24,000. Leukemias are more common in children, you know, but you see them throughout adulthood. Lymphomas are more common in adults, but, you know, they occur in younger people too. That's human leukemia. This is the incidence of human leukemia. And, and when you go to the doctor and you ask, what, what, what gave this horrible disease to my granddaughter or my daughter? Or my grandpa, what, why does he have lymphoma? Why? Tell me why. Well, the standard and only acceptable answer in my business is we don't know the cause. It's unknown. If you say otherwise, I, I have no doubt that you'll be looked at with some criticism by a lot of the people in the medical business. Well, actually, most of them don't know or don't care. But those who have learned this pat answer, when you ask a question, what causes this, what causes that? Well, we just don't know. Well, you know, we could know if we took the trouble to learn the facts and to get out a lot of some of our biases uh, off the table, like our dinner plate of bacon and eggs. We, we, could, we could, as medical doctors, tell you we just don't know. We don't know because we haven't looked. It's not that it's not known. Just we haven't looked. Or if we've looked, we decided we're not going to accept this answer. Uh, many of you have kitty cats. Yeah. And uh, when you take your kitty cat to the veterinarian, the, kid, the veterinarians recommends a annual feline leukemia virus vaccine. In other words, veterinarians know that leukemia can be caused by a virus. Uh, UC Berkeley, a few years back, a department uh, that is still there, they're still doing research, still publishing to date on what I'm going to talk to you about right now, nothing's changed, is what they did is they went out on the streets of Berkeley and they asked about 250 people to give them a, a sample of blood, randomly, just pick people off the street. And they took it back and they examined their blood. Well, as they say in this paper, we didn't find bovine leukemia viruses when we looked prior to 1970s because of our crude technology. They said right there in their paper, you know, based on the failure experiments in the 1970s. But then we had immunofluorescence technology developed. It's called immunoblotting, which is 100 times more sensitive and more specific. So we could detect more reliably the presence of infection. And in this particular case, they started looking for antibodies, not, not the actual virus, but antibodies that 
tell the researchers that the virus had been in the person's body. Could have been in their dead. In other words, cooked virus from steak. Sure could have been. But remember that that I want to I want to pink on the inside order that so many people make. It just you understand. Anyway, they uh, they found seventy four percent of the samples tested were positive for antibodies to to bovine leukemia virus. You know, fortunately, the human being is pretty tough, and it doesn't translate into everybody getting leukemia. And I showed you the rates in the last slides. So uh, you say, well, you know, these are just antibodies. It could be from cooked steak, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, this group, uh, they took 95 uh, women from Kaiser Permanente, asked them for their blood. And what they found is that a third of them had live viruses in their cells. And there, there's other, other research done from different parts of the world that show a similar finding. Colombia, 41%, Australia, 61%, et cetera. About a third of people are infected with live viruses that we can detect, bovine leukemia viruses. Well, you say, okay, that's no problem because we have pasteurization. You know, we, we heat that milk uh, for 20 minutes at least. Kills everything. You don't have to worry about it. Based on what? I mean, how much research would you like to have to decide it's safe to feed your family dairy? Would you accept 23 studies, excuse me, 23 experimental settings where they took cows infected with bovine leukemia virus and injected the virus into sheep, 23 pairs. That's it. That's just all the research I can find. And what they found is in those that they they gave the unpasteurated milk to, they got leukemia. But those that get pasteurated milk, they didn't. But there are only 23 cows and sheep pairs that were tested. That's it. It's not enough for me. You know, we, we, we can spend millions of dollars on testing statin drugs. Why, why can't we spend more than 23 cow sheep pairings that were done back in the 80s and 70s? Huh, maybe they don't care. And pasteurization. Well, you know, we got a couple issues here. One is that pasteurization sometimes fails. And you get unpasteurized, you know, milk going into the bottle. But how about those people who don't believe in pasteurized milk? Those who drink raw milk? Well, in a, in a study uh, between the years 1998 and 2011, uh, raw milk was, uh, well, let's say raw milk, uh, oh, they, the, the infections due to raw milk, 79% of them were caused by consuming dairy products. Of the of the of the infections that they found between those years, if you look at farmer families, farm families, oh, farm families. Okay, you look at people who live on a farm and make their living by being farmers. Uh, they they uh, are more likely to be in contact with raw milk, and what you find is somewhere between thirty five and sixty percent of the uh, farming families have consumed raw milk. And currently, currently, three and a half percent are have had raw milk in the last seven days when they did the survey. The virus, you say, okay, how about we we have this virus? It's intact. It's it's called an RNA virus. It's a retrovirus involved in protein uh, synthesis from genetic material and the production of. Well, anyway, DNA to RNA, et cetera. So uh, what happens when you heat this genetic material? It's broken up into fragments. Okay, they're, they're called RNA-derived fragments. And what they find is these fragments are involved in cancer cell proliferation, metastases, progression, and survival. 
So actually, it's been brought up the fact that these fragments may be more deleterious than the whole virus because they fit into our own genetic material. That's the way they function. They're incorporated into our genes. So what should you do? Well, you should resist the temptation to pour your child a tall, cool glass of leukemia virus or its fragments. All right, I want to talk to you about just another thing, just to kind of lighten things up a little bit. I have another passion in life, and it's resolved in a website I produce called uh, Diet and Climate. It's about diet and climate. And it's uh, the website uh, link is uh, mcdougallfoundation.org. Okay, mcdougallfoundation.org. And I'd like you to go there because it's Mary's and my effort, along with Heather's tremendous help, to share with you how to change your diet to contribute to the salvation of our planet. But there's one other way that we have to act. Uh, I mean, cleaning up the carbon, transportation, electric cars, sun power, et cetera. I mean, that, that's all really important and changing diets really important. But we've blown past the limits of, of temperature and CO2 in the atmosphere that that's not gonna be enough, folks. And researchers know that. You read it in the paper all the time. But we have to do something. And something that's recommended is geoengineering. And but what's recommended is like uh, putting uh, uh, mirrors up towards the sun and blocking out the radiation from the sun, reflect the sunlight back with geoengineering. And there, uh, the an, another big effort that just came out this week in the New York Times is to do carbon capture. This is one of the worst jokes on the human population. Carbon. Can you imagine building machines that in any way can compete with trees? Can you imagine what it would cost to capture this carbon? It's just completely impractical. An article here just recently, February 28th, on how what we need to do is we need to get thousands of ships out there in the sea and spray seawater up into the clouds to make them thicker. Well, all this kind of atmospheric uh, intervention, well, scientists are concerned that we're going to cause some hazards that are going to hurry up our extinction from planet Earth. But I'm going to show you what I believe is our only hope our last best hope. And some of you are gonna listen. And who knows, maybe somebody of uh, uh, enough influence to bring this to attention of, of the population, of the whole population of this planet, will bring one over and show you in the next slide to, to the attention of people that can make a meaningful difference. Not that you can't, because you can. You know, the, it always begins with one person and then it spreads. So that's why I'm showing this to you is I believe there's a way that we can salvage at least somewhat of a future. And that's to go to this website. It's mere.org, M-E-E-R.org. Uh, Yi Tao, who I happen to know pretty well, is the brilliant investigator that's behind all this. This is a volunteer organization. Uh, volunteer organization. Why? Because you can't make money doing what I'm going to tell you right now. Or at least nobody's figured out a way to make money. And that is Yitao has, just, has put together a program well detailed in science. I mean, solid science. This guy's brilliant. Where you take, do you take the, the waste from our garbage dumps, particularly the plastic bottles and aluminum cans, and you turn them into mirrors? And you reflect sunlight. And they've shown you can do this. This is in Freetown, Africa. They, they've cooled this town by, by putting these mirrors over the town. And, you know, we have a, a, an amount of the planet that we can cover with these mirrors to lower the temperature. It's temperature that we have to deal with. This is called global warming. Anyway, you heard my side note. That's my That's my pitch. That's what you have to listen to. Uh, as an advertisement for my hopefully enjoyable, beneficial talk on bovine leukemia viruses. <laughs>